I'm here with Alexander McCurse, editor-in-chief of the Duran. Alexander, let's talk about the ECB and the last days of Mario Draghi. It looks like uh, we have more QE, quantitative easing, uh, taking place under the direction of Mario Draghi. He is out, I believe, in November, and Christine Lagarde takes his place. What do you make of this latest move by Draghi, which is kind of a shock to, to the market yeah. that, that, he's, that he's taking this route with just a couple of months left in the ECB chair? Well, indeed. I mean, what he's basically done is he's doubling down on the ECB policy, which he has followed, European monetary policy. He's followed ever since he became chair of the European Central Bank. We should remember that before Draghi came along, the policy of the European Central Bank, which was very, very much influenced by the German Bundesbank at that time, was that they would not do quantitative easing and that they would actually keep proper interest rates. This was a policy very much modelled after the kind of policy that the German Central Bank has followed in Germany ever since it was set up um, after the Second World War. And many Germans see that very you know, careful, uh, orthodox monetary policy as what underpinned Germany's post-war economic su success. Anyway, Draghi came along, threw all of that out of the window. He said he would do whatever it takes to keep the euro together. He started to buy government bonds, which he was not supposed to do. This was, you know, it was allegedly illegal, but he, he started in effect to buy government bonds to keep the debt situation in Italy and Spain and Portugal in the so-called pigs under control. He cut interest rates. He went for quantitative easing on a big scale. He behaved, in other words, not like a German central banker, but like an Italian central banker, which is ultimately what he is. And he is continuing as in that uh, course right up to the last moment when he will leave and be replaced by Christine Lagarde, who is, of course, French and a lawyer and who is known to be very much of the same school as Draghi, perhaps taking it even further. So we've now had a further announcement of more QE, 20 billion euros worth. We've had another uh, interest rate cut, of, I think 0.10%, not huge, but you know, bear in mind, we're looking at a world of negative interest rates, especially in Europe. As I've discussed on in previous programs, I was in Germany just a few weeks ago, and I was hearing from all sorts of people in Germany growing anger about this policy, about how interest rates were being forced down, how they're now in negative territory, how savers and Germany, Germany is a country which has traditionally favoured savers, savers. Savers are being punished, how that is undermining um, investment, long term investment, and how it is uh, 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 feeding on um, bad investment decisions as people are being forced increasingly to go for ever more reckless and speculative investments in order to uh, uh, make any kind of profit, any kind of money on their savings. And as I think I mentioned, I heard complaints about this from bankers. I heard this from restaurant owners. I, I heard it from pretty much everyone I spoke to who wanted to discuss economics. So what Draghi is doing is he's going to make the Germans even more angry with the way the direction in which the Eurozone is being taken. And we can be sure that he's discussed this all with Christine Lagarde, who's coming in because he's not going to have done this entirely off his own bat without first speaking to her. And we can be sure that she will not only take this policy, but she will pursue it even further. So this is a policy that hurts Germany. Who are the beneficiaries? Macron in France, who has tried to uh, reflate the economy in, in France to head off pressure from the Gilets Jaunes and who needs more monetary easing to keep that going because France is producing more debt. 
So they need quantitative easing to help them deal with that debt. And of course, the new government in Italy, led by Giuseppe Conte, which has uh, uh, formed this alliance with the, Demo the, the, you know, the centre-left Democratic Party, the party that uh, Conte and the Five Star Movement that he belongs to were supposed to replace, but they're now in coalition with to keep Salvini out of power. So we see this situation where um, the central bank is once again helping the ultra-integrationists, people like Macron in France, people like the Conte, new Conte government in Italy, and the people who are being screwed are, the, are German savers. Okay, I was just about to, to make that point, Alexander, is that it looks like the ECB is aligning with, with the integrationists in Macron yes. and, and uh, the Italian government. Yes. Um, of course, you know, they want to prop up the Italian government because they don't want to see Salvini coming to power. And of course, they want to prop up Macron. Does this also show that uh, Germany under Merkel is has become much weaker than France under Macron in the scheme of, of who has the power in Europe? I'm always saying in the scheme of the European Union. In other words, there being more emphasis placed on Macron and his followers than on Merkel and her followers. And I'm not saying Merkel's not an integrationist. She is, but she's more of a, uh, I guess you could say more of a, a fiscally conservative yes. integrationist. Yes. So does this show once again that Merkel is losing ground as far as who has the influence in Brussels and in the European Union? Yes, that's exactly what it shows. The dominant personality in European politics at the moment is Emmanuel Macron. He has an ally now in Conte in Italy. He has an, uh, he has an ally in Mario Draghi in the European Central Bank, and he's going to have an even stronger ally when uh, um, Christine Lagarde takes over in a few weeks. So at this moment in time, Macron is the most important figure in Europe. There is a fundamental difference between the German vision of integration in Europe and the French vision of integration in Europe. The Germans don't want an over-centralized Europe. Germany itself is a decentralized federal country. They want a Europe which is relatively still, you know, integrated, but still reasonably decentralized with Germany on top and everyone else following the sort of German system. What the French want, what Macron wants, is a French model for Europe. He wants a very centralized European government in Brussels, which let's never forget is a francophone city. The dominant language in Brussels is French, especially in the business world. As I witnessed myself, I've had family in Brussels. Um, and he wants it integrated, centralized, centrally controlled, dominated by the French elite, of which Macron is a part, and at the same time sustaining the positions of that elite in places like France and Italy by running the very kind of lax monetary policies that France and Italy have historically always had, which the Germans are very averse to. So what we see is that Merkel is becoming increasingly eclipsed and the French and Macron are getting stronger. And I'm going to make a, one prediction. If there is a Brexit, which at this moment in time is perhaps less certain than it looked at one point, but if there is a Brexit and Britain leaves the European Union, then Merkel's position will become weaker still because on economic issues, the British have tended to support Germany in this debates in the European Council. So um, Merkel will become even more isolated as she faces in the European Council and in the European institutions, a situation where the French Italian axis that we now see, also the Spanish axis, because I forgot to mention that the Spanish 
socialist government is also very closely aligned with Macron is now becoming increasingly decisive. Now, I, I have to, I will finish by saying that, of course, Merkel herself is undergoing pressure in Germany. And one of the great mistakes, in my opinion, that the integrationists in France and Spain and Italy and Belgium are making is that they're taking Germany for granted. And um, there is a mood shift in Germany, which I, I, I couldn't help but notice when I was there, even in rhineland Pfalz in Western Germany, where I was, people are becoming more critical and that we're nowhere near the point yet where that criticism reaches cr critical mass. It's starting to happen. You're starting to see it happen. So if Macron and Lagarde and currently Draghi push this too far, there could be a very strong reaction. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's almost like a, a kind of civil war in the in the EU right now in that, like you noted, you have France and you have, you know, um, Spain and now you have the new government in Italy and Lagarde's now going to be at the ECB and, and France is now consolidating, you know, this, no. this power. Yes. At the same time, Merkel has diminished a lot. Yes. To her own faults. I mean, you know, she, she yeah. mismanaged everything. Yes. Um, but you also have the globalists and the integrationists. They went after, for example, Austria, and they took down the government there. They're gunning for Hungary. They're, they're gunning for the Netherlands. Uh, they're gunning for Poland. So you see a lot of the countries that are aligned, say, with Germany, more traditionally aligned with the German school of thought. You know, they're, they're, they're under tremendous pressure from the globalists as well. Either they've been taken out, like, for example, yes. Austria, or they're being targeted for destruction. Yes. Like in the case of Hungary, for example. So, so you see, yes. you definitely see the the French side under Macron is is also very aggressive in yes. their stance towards you know Germany and the countries that align with Germany. Exactly, that is exactly right. And as I said, of course, at the end of the day, I mean, you can play games in Austria, you can even play games in Italy. Italy is, of course, a country which has always had historically a very weak political system. Though we should not underestimate. Matteo Salvini and the forces that he represents. We've done a recent program about this in which we've said, and I, you know, I still maintain that Salvini as the leader of the opposition in Italy is a potent force and one which will eventually become stronger. But you can pick off weaker countries. But of course, Germany is a completely different case. And you're quite right about Merkel. Merkel, the former queen of Europe, is now dethroned. She is dethroned from her position in Europe. She's no longer the queen of Europe. And before very long, she won't be chancellor of Germany either. Yeah, excellent point. Alexander Merkur, editor-in-chief of the Durand. Thank you very much. Guys, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button down below. Click on the notifications bell to make sure you get notifications every time we push out a new video. And remember, you can get an audio copy of this video. Follow us on iTunes and SoundCloud. You will find those links in the description box down below. And please donate to us on PayPal, Patreon, and subscribe star. Your donation helps keep this channel up and running. We appreciate your donations very, very much. And another thing that helps keep this channel up and running is when you make purchases on the Duran shop like a Lavrov mug or Mom. say a double-headed embroidered eagle logo like what Alexander has on mm. that polo shirt. It's Alexander, the Lavrov well, mug looks good. It looks it looks good because it's fantastic. Magic mug. mugs. My magic mugs. I mean, can I just repeat again that it's an absolutely beautiful mug, wonderful porcelain body, light and strong to handle, incredibly incredibly elegant i mean alex has just uh, been drinking out of his mug with the uh, russian state symbol the double-headed eagle there i've got sergey lavrov who's my favorite foreign minister he's for me everything that a foreign minister should be he's calm under pressure he's incredibly hard working he's exceptionally well informed He's a superb diplomat. He's charming when he needs to be. He's very tough, extremely tough when he needs to be also. He is an absolutely superb foreign minister. And I think most people 
who uh, follow international affairs agree that he's the best foreign minister around and in fact has been so for a very long time and of course given that I admire him so much I had to have him on one of our Duran magic mugs and there he is so um, but it's not just mugs you can get on our shop you can get fantastic shirts like the polo shirt I'm wearing which is one of my wife's favorite polo shirts she says I look particularly good in this one and she particularly likes this gray color by the way which she thinks is you know very fetching when it's when I'm wearing it so well there you go that's a woman's eye and it's beautifully cut it's 100 percent cotton it's incredibly smart very comfortable to wear all our shirts like our mugs are of absolutely the highest quality um we have really fine merchandise we've also unfortunately got some imitators now who you must be extremely careful uh, about they're copying our products but their products are very inferior ours are excellent we're getting amazing feedback you can find all these things on our shop we've got shirts like this with, the, with our double-headed eagle we've got t-shirts we've got long sleeve t-shirts we've got hoodies we've got hats we've got stickers alex is thinking of more and more things all the time we've got books on russiagate books on brexit help the duran help yourself by owning these wonderful things go to our shop alex will tell you how just uh, look at the description box down below, the DuranShop.com. Pick something up, help this channel out. Alexander Rekers, Editor-in-Chief of the Duran. Thank you very much. Until next time, everybody, take care.